I see you are ready. Uh, Mr. Shai from Caspa. Welcome, Shai. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's a great pleasure being here. And uh, I'm here to talk uh, about Caspa now. How many of you have uh, actually heard about Caspa? I'm very curious. What was like, seems like most of you haven't, which is uh, great news because it seems we have a lot of room for growth. Uh, so I'm here to talk about, if I talked about everything I wanted to say about Caspa will be a whole day, so I'm concentrating today about what makes Caspa decentralized, why it is so uniquely decentralized, and more than that, what makes it uh, appeal to miners and how we um, address the stress, the tension between designated hardware and uh, decentralization. Um, so CASPA, for those of you who don't know, is um, a proof of work, a pure proof of work, uh, which is able to uh, solve the scalability issue. Um, we are able to run at a very large throughputs of uh, thousands of transactions per second with uh, very high block rates um, on uh, affordable hardware, purely on the layer one. Uh, this is um, uh, a snippet of a live demonstration. This is uh, actually, if you go uh, look for uh, the KGI, you could see this, uh, each one of these is an actual block created in real time and ordered in real time. Uh, so this is a bit about our uh, performance. Um, but uh, as I said, I want to talk about what makes Caspa decentralized. So um, I'm going to later, if time permits, talk about, uh, more about uh, these uh, decentralization properties. Um, but essentially, we have the Nakamoto consensus, and the entire development is driven by the community. There is no foundation. There is no company. And the coin was fair launched, so there is no uh, a single entity that holds a lot of the coin and uh, makes all of the decision and there were no pre-mines and no pre-allocations. And we work a lot to decentralize the knowledge and uh, make uh, contributing and being involved with the coin as accessible as possible for anyone who wants to be a part. And uh, we also work hard to make the nodes run on cheap hardware so that uh, anyone could run a node. Um, and the two features I'm going to talk about the most is that we decentralize the mining itself and how we do that, and how uh, we made sure that there is a very good coin spread despite uh, being very ASIC friendly. Uh, which this, uh, I think, the centralizing the mining and centralizing the coin spread are the two greatest objections to why um, ASICs harm decentralizations. So uh, we spend a lot of time thinking about how we could address this. So how do ASICs... Um, contradict this decentralization. Um, so the metric I'm going to talk about is what uh, we call the revenue delay. Essentially, it means how long a miner would have to wait before they start to see block, before they start to see a profit. Um, so the hardware uh, entry barrier, which I will just call HEB, is uh, essentially what fraction of the global hash rate you would need to see a block, uh, say, daily. And so the three tenets of uh, uh, how ASIC centralized mining is that you have a high hub for solo mining and for pool mining and for pool coin spread. Um, so the, this measure, the hub, the how long you have to wait before you see any profit, uh, it's calculated a bit differently for pooled mining and solo mining. So I'm going to start with uh, solo mining. And uh, in this case, it's very simple. Um, it's essentially, the HEB is uh, essentially um, the block delay over how many blocks are produced a day. So, for example, if you have a block once an hour, say, then to see a block once a day, you would need 1 24th of the entire hash rate. So, how does it look on different coins? So, starting with Bitcoin, uh, the block delay is 600 seconds, so if you do the math, you see that to see a daily block, you would need about 0.7% of 
of the entire global hash rate. Uh, stated differently, it means that in Bitcoin, the Bitcoin network can support at most 150 different solo miners or mining pools that see a daily, daily income. In Litecoin, you have uh, four times as much. In Dogecoin, you'd have 10 times as much. And it's just a direct calculation of the um, block delay. In Ethereum Classic, you'd have 40 times as much. Uh, in Caspa, we, right now Caspa runs on one block per second, you would see 600 times as much than in Bitcoin. And uh, when we go to 10 blocks per second, which we already successfully did in the testnet, we'd get, get 6,000 times as much. So the Caspa network can hold up to 900,000 solo miners or mining pools that have daily income. So this is our solution for the first uh, pillar, for uh, iHeb for solo mining. Now in pooled mining, it's uh, a bit harder to calculate, but essentially what governs it is the fees. The higher the fees, the more you'd have to accumulate before you cash back, because if you cash back too early, then most of your, uh, most of your revenue is going to be wasted on fees. So uh, essentially, in the long run, in the limit where, uh, where the fees become dominant over the block rewards, the um, cost of a single transaction becomes uh, pretty much proportional, the inversely proportional to the TPS. So the high transaction per second throughput is what's uh, going to give us um, this uh, low uh, hardware barrier for, for uh, pooled mining. So even if you pool, you'd still need a lot less hardware than you need in other coins. And about the poor coin spread, this is where things get a bit uh, counterintuitive. So our goal is to have most of the coins already be in circulation before ASICs emerge, before they appear on the network. And the motivation for that is because GPU miners, first of all, because GPUs are much more accessible, and as long as you are GPU mineable, then um, a lot more people can get the coin. And uh, beside that, GPU mining has much higher, uh, higher operational costs. So GPU miners sell more coins just to cover the costs of mining, making for better coin spread. Now, how are you going to uh, assure that this thing happens? So first, there is the bad solution, what's called the uh, ASIC resistance. Essentially, it means that you want to make your uh, protocol hard to mine with ASICs. You want to make the ASICs inefficient and disincentivize ASICs. Now, I call this the bad solution because I see it as kind of a lose-lose. Because eventually, designated hardware will always win. No matter what you do, uh, unless you keep uh, forking and changing the algorithm, you will find that uh, eventually ASIC mining will drive GPU mining to be non-competitive. But if you use an ASIC resistant algorithm, you also lose all the benefits of ASIC mining. You lose the high stability. You use the fact that GPUs can still be used to attack the network. If a GPU is 10 times or 50 times less efficient, then yeah, you wouldn't mine with it, but they could be helpful for attacking the network. If GPUs are 10,000 times less efficient, then they couldn't even help you in a surge, in a momentary attack. And also, you just want to have this good CAPEX-OPEX ratio. You want most of the um, costs of mining to be capital and not operational, because then when you reach the regime where fees are uh, the dominating the rewards for mining, um, you, would, uh, you would want miners to be incentivized to keep mining. Um, and you don't want uh, to make it profitable to shut down the machines just because it costs a lot of money to keep them running. So the solution we came up with is what we call the rapid emission schedule. Essentially, we start with an algorithm which is very ASIC friendly, but we modified it just a little bit so all the existing hardware, including FPGAs and GPUs, couldn't mine it yet, counting on the fact that by the time the hardware is created, most of the coin is already in circulation. And we tried to emulate the Bitcoin schedule. We wanted that by the time ASICs appear, um, so we say 70 or 80% of the coin is already in circulation. And 
Um, for that, we designed this uh, emission schedule. Which there were six months of a uh, fixed rate, and then we went on this very rapid uh, down curve. Of, uh, uh, we essentially reduced the block rewards by about 5% every month, which accumulates to 50% a year. As of now, uh, more than 70%, I think, has already been uh, um, in circulation. And essentially, we are just about the same as Bitcoin in this sense, that uh, ASICs uh, started to become uh, available for retailers around 65-70%. Um, yeah, so this is the emission uh, curve. Um, so this is how we address these uh, three issues. Um, so uh, to recap, um, what I'm saying is that high BPS and high TPS are both crucial to have decentralized ASIC friendliness and decentralized mining. The TPS you can also achieve by layer two solutions, but if you want the decentralized solo mining and you want small pools, then you must have high BPS. And the rapid emission is our answer to coin spread. Um, and two, uh, some other benefits of uh, CASPA to miners are, first of all, the reliable um, revenue is in. All I talked about is how long you would wait on average, but there is also this uh, issue of variance because you could have enough mining equipment to, to mine a block once a day, but if the block rate is very small, then you would see large fluctuations. One day you see three blocks, and, the other, and then you don't see a block for a week. So miners actually have to take a larger margin of error if they want to not find themselves not uh, obtaining any revenue for a long time. And the high sample rate we have due to the high block rate greatly reduces this variance. So it gives you know, even more leeway. And the fact that there are no orphans means that there are uh, no wasted blocks. So 100% of the work done by the miners uh, actually um, benefits the network. And uh, two works in progress uh, is one is that uh, the asynchronous structure of DAGs seems to provide uh, new and uh, better ways to, to combat MEV. And uh, the, it seems also that since we have parallel blocks and the way you choose transaction is randomized, it smooths out a lot of the kinks in the Bitcoin fee market and creates a much healthier fee market and a much uh, better equilibria for uh, mining strategies. Um, so just uh, in a nutshell, other ways in which CASPA is decentralized. Um, so first of all, we have an uh, increasingly, uh, continuously increasing community, which is crucial because we are community driven. Um, so you can see we have a lot of wallet downloads. Uh, here on this graph, you can see the, how the hash rate grew on the first days. So it took, uh, in the first weeks, we were like, will we ever get to a giga, rate, giga hash? Right, and within two months we were already at four terra. So we've seen a lot of engagements. And this slide says that the current hash rate is uh, 20 peta hash, but uh, exactly, actually it's been a week since I made it, and now we are already on the around 24 peta hash. So we see that as of now, the hash rate keeps growing tremendously. And the thing we also need, because we are community driven, we don't have a foundation, we don't have a budget for marketing and development, we develop, we um, get developers from the community. And people join us for the intrigue of the tech and because they believe in the tech and we see that our community is growing, devs are joining, programmers, content creators, even this uh, beautiful presentation was made by a community member which has a personal stake in CASPA. And all the decisions are made by the community through a voting process. The projects that are funded are funded through um, uh, community funding, which goes to community funds. These funds are not controlled by any of the original contributors. They go to multi-sig wallets whose treasurers were chosen in a poll by the community. And everything is completely community driven. And we have integrations and marketing found and a lot of core development. And uh, we work very hard to make everything work on very cheap hardware. As I said, we ran 3,000 TPS 
on an open permissionless network um, with constant storage. People joined and participated in, the, in this experiment running on hardware, which is a hundred or a hundred fifty dollar uh, expensive uh, cost. So it's really open for everyone. And uh, I'm a bit over time, but that's the last slide. <laughs> Um, the one thing we also try to do all the time is to decentralize the knowledge. We try to make everything we do peer-reviewed and published or open to discussion in various forums. We, do, we engage the community all the time, educate people, make a lot of knowledge available, um, spend a lot of time training and uh, um, mentoring new developers and bringing them into the fold and uh, uh, we see uh, people that came from the community are now doing the most complicated things. They uh, develop the consensus code and become really, um, really a, a huge part of what we're doing. And uh, it uh, decentralizes the fact that uh, we don't want to have only three or four people who are able to manage this code. And so we increase that circle and make sure that there isn't a single point of failure in our process. And um, so that's all I wanted to say about CASPA. If you have any more questions, you can find me around. I will be glad to talk to any of you. And uh, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Shai.